Hello, everyone, and welcome to our talk, Designing for Daydream. How many people here attended a VR talk yesterday? It's really great to see this. Um, it's so nice to see so many people who have been designing VR for a while and who are just really excited about everything we're doing here at I.O., and then people who are just getting started. So for Daydream, our goal here is uh, enabling high, very high quality mobile VR, all the way from like hardware up through the stack to the user experience. So we really want to make sure that we're giving you everything that you need to create really compelling VR immersive experiences. And we've talked a lot this week about everything from hardware optimizations to developer tools. And we had some great talks yesterday, too. So yesterday, we talked about VR filmmaking. We had a really great talk on lessons learned from design labs for our, from our rapid prototyping team. And you can watch all of this on YouTube if you missed any of this. And so today, we want to go a bit deeper in designing for Daydream and talk all about the key ingredients and considerations uh, for designing for Daydream. So really, you know, what's important for creating great VR content that's comfortable, engaging, but also unique? And to do this, we're going to walk you through four different lightning talks. So the first of these, at the center of the experience, we're going to take a look at your audience. So who are you designing for? What, what do we know about them already? And what, what of that can help you create the very best content for them? And then we're going to take a look at the ergonomics of that user in VR. So what are the important considerations and constraints that can give you a starting point for designing and prototyping in VR? Next, creating a feeling of presence and being able to transport people to different realities is really key to crafting VR. So we're going to talk you through why crafting the right environment is important and also how to get it right. And then finally, we're going to explore something else that's also really important for presence, which is input and how you can use a world of interactions that are made possible with our Daydream controller. And now I'm going to hand this over to Dave, and he's going to talk to you about your audience. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lindsay. So over the past year, Google's VR team has been doing a lot of research to better understand how people are using high-end mobile devices. Whoops. I skipped ahead. How people are using high-end mobile devices, um, but also how we can make VR a part of our daily life. And today, I want to share three insights from that research with you that I think will help us build better experiences. And the first insight from the research that we took away was that VR is really compelling to a broad number of people and for many, many different reasons. There's a large audience of people who want to get into VR. And what they told us when we talked to them was that VR is really this great gateway to enable them to have new experiences, new forms of entertainment, also change their perspective on how they might see things, but also give them new abilities, whether it be superhuman abilities or superpowers, to do things they couldn't actually do in real life. And I want to go through a couple of these. So the first is gaming. Gaming is a powerful opportunity for VR, and not just hardcore gaming, all types of gaming. So let's take an example here, my golf game. I love to play golf. Traditionally, a golf game, you would have sort of the third-person perspective. You'd see the person swing in their club, you control with a controller. But with VR, the controller can become your putter. You can take on the perspective of that golfer. So you can line up over that putt, you can actually make it and see the ball go in the hole. That's a really compelling perspective. Next, personal cinema. VR can become your own personal cinema. If you're watching a video, a movie, uh, a binging on TV shows, you don't need to be constrained to a small little screen anymore, whether your screen is 30 inches, 60 inches, even 100 inches. VR can immerse people in that content. So rather than seeing those raindrops sort of trickling down on your screen 10 feet in front of you, you can actually feel like those raindrops are going to hit that leaf and sort of bounce off and hit you because you're kind of in the content itself. VR can also take people to new places, places that we kind of only dream about. Um, I would love to become an astronaut, tour space, find new places. Probably not going to happen in my lifetime. Maybe it will. But in VR, we can all become that space explorer. We can all go to Mars in sort of the snap of our fingers. We can be teleported there. We could be standing next to the rover or even exploring other planets that maybe we haven't even discovered yet. VR also provides a more intimate way to bring people together, more so than, say, traditional communication technologies. You know, daily life doesn't afford us the ability to be around the people that we care about, whether it's our, our loved ones, friends, colleagues, acquaintances, 
VR can bring people together across distance and time, and it could put us in that virtual coffee shop where we could interact with objects, we could sit side by side. It could be the next best thing to actually having that face-to-face -face conversation that real life may not afford us at that time. There's also huge learning opportunities. VR can be sort of the premier place to learn and also to sort of have personal growth. Imagine this engine here. In VR, I could take that engine apart with a wave of my hand. I could see how all the pieces come together. I could see all the steps and how I might assemble it. That might be really difficult in real life. And it's also, if I make a mistake, it could be really effortful to undo that mistake. But in VR, you could undo that really easy, try again, oh, didn't work. I could undo it and try again. You could make experiential uh, learning really easy. And on the flip side of that coin, there's also experiential creation. VR can become the premier place for self-expression or creativity. It's a place where I could create and craft my masterpiece. You have control over the palette, the color, the tools, the perspective, the size. If I want to make my thing small, I can make it small, but I could very easily then grow it and make it larger. That's something you really can't do in real life very easily. But in VR, you can. The only limitation really here is the tools that we provide people and their imagination. And finally, access to professional services and um, professionals themselves. Throughout our life, you know, we need access to people who can help us do things. For example, buying a home. You typically reach out to a real estate professional to help you do with that task. They can guide you through the process, help you understand all the rules, take you from place to place. But doing that in real life, that can be quite effortful. It takes a full afternoon, a weekend, to go visit five different homes, five different rentals that you're thinking of getting into. But with a snap of a finger in VR, the real estate agent could take you from A to B to C. They could take you to 20 places in the same time that you could drive between three or four. What's also interesting about this case, sort of looking at AR, VR together, is that I could visit this blank home, and they could change all the content in that space to match my style. Rather than walking into a staged home that doesn't meet what I would typically want to move into, so I can't really, it doesn't really resonate with me, or just an empty space, an agent could take that space and put all my stuff in and be like, oh, this actually does feel like a space I could live in. So beyond motivations and sort of aspirational expectations, we also learned a little bit about how people are using these devices today. And one of the things that we found inspirational is that people are using a lot of these devices not just for snackable moments. Snackable moments, typically, you might associate with a phone. You pull your phone out of your pocket, you respond to a text message, you read an email, check a, check a stock quote, and then you put it back in your pocket and you move on with your day. You keep sipping your coffee. That's a snackable moment. But VR can be like a really good, compelling book. Um, as long as the content is good and entertaining, it can really keep people's attention drawn into it. So for example, if someone's playing a game or visiting new places, and that content really has them attached, they, people have told us that they can be in a session for 30 or more minutes. If they're binging on TV shows or they're watching a movie, what people told us is that sessions can be 90 minutes or longer. What's really important here is the quality of that content, the content itself, and that's what's going to keep people engaged, and also their comfort during that experience. Finally, the third point, speaking of comfort, what we learned from people when we talked to them was that most of the time, even though these devices are portable, our phone's portable, our headset's portable, you can put it in a bag or purse and take it with you, a lot of people are using these devices primarily in their home, seated comfortably. So when we did in-home visits with people, what a lot of them actually showed us is they kind of have like a comfy spot, a comfy spot where they sort of use their VR headset. Whether that comfy spot was a couch, a favorite seat, or laying on their bed, what was clear from the conversations with them, what they showed us was that standing really wasn't something that they did a lot of. It gets tiring to stand up for 30 minutes, especially it gets tiring standing up trying to watch a 90-minute video. That's something they would do sort of comfortably relaxed laying down. And I think this is an important point to bring up because a lot of the experiences that we're going to be building, we need to recognize that people aren't necessarily going to be standing up and moving around a lot. They're probably going to be seated comfortably. And that's something we need to take into account when we're actually building something for them. And on that note, I'm going to hand off to Mike, who will talk about building comfortable virtual experiences. So VR can seem like an intimidating medium to design for because you can do so much 
So constraints can be nice to use as starting points. The limits of your body is one of those constraints to start with. Digital designers are used to thinking about how the eye is guided through things, or how the thumb can reach where easily on a phone, for example. When you're designing for Daydream, you can think about how someone's moving their head, how much of the scene they can see, and how far away things are. Since you're probably used to working with an artboard or canvas, you can think about how much they move as your new boundaries. If it's a standing thing, they can go all the way around. They just can just see a certain amount at a time. What they see kind of looks like a cone from the side. But if we look at it from their point of view, it's a circle. If you have a UI panel covering more than 70 degrees of that field of view, or 35 to each side, then it starts to feel like the theater screen is as much as you could even look at. For reference, an IMAX screen from the middle seat is 70 degrees. If the user is sitting in a stationary chair, like their couch, then there's boundaries to how far they'll comfortably move their neck. They can easily go all the way to 80 degrees to each side, but 30 is kind of a comfortable center point left and right. If you really stretch, you can put stuff further, but remember that they'll have to strain their neck or change their posture and turn their shoulders if it's you know, too far and they're sitting on a couch. Vertically, you tend to look down a little, like 15 degrees from the horizon. But it depends more on your posture. Like reclining in a seat, you can't look down as far because your neck is there. So with those constraints, you've got a field of view and a range of motion. And that's one way to think about what your canvas is. Things can be placed all over the range of motion, but the user will only be able to see what's in the field of view at a time. We also add depth to that. Too close in, like a half meter for too long, is uncomfortable because it feels like it's up in your face. You might think that you want to put things right next to your face, like a helmet, but you'll find pretty quick that it makes you have to go cross-eyed to even see it. Too far past 20 meters, and you can't really see the difference in depth very easily. So most of your main content and UI stuff will fall within this zone here, where depth is meaningful and comfortable to see. By the way, to help people understand the depth between objects, shadows and imperfections in the texture are really important. So if you have subtle noise in your textures and represent light realistically, it'll really help give your users more cues to understand depth in the way that their brains were wired to automatically. The reason is the imperfections give your eyes something to converge on. Without them, a large flat color might look like an infinite void of that color. Watching this, you can see the little specks on your screen surface, and you perceive its depth. But in VR, you don't have that. So the importance of shadows is something that we already knew from material design. But the necessity of subtle texture noise is unique to VR. If you're creating UI, it's also helpful to know that resolution is a major constraint. As they said at the last I.O., it's more useful to talk about resolution in terms of pixels per degree. You can approximate how many pixels on the screen fit in one degree of your field of view near the center. It's reasonable to expect that resolution will increase over time. But for now, we have this situation where aliasing makes hard edges and thin lines dance and sparkle distractingly. More anti-aliasing looks better, but can hurt your performance. So that's an interesting design constraint to give yourself, trying to avoid high contrast edges and thin lines. That also begs the question of how big to make text so that you can still read it. How small is too small? As time goes on and more pixels get packed in, you'll be able to read smaller text until you eventually get to 2020 vision, which you could say is in the ballpark of 60 pixels per degree. But current VR headsets are only around 10 to maybe 13 pixels per degree. As pixels per degree increases, your text can be smaller. There's barely readable. And then there's comfortably readable. Right now, your starting point is about 1.5 degrees of that field of view. Of course, it'll be smaller later as uh, companies smash more pixels in and VR approaches, hopefully, 2020 vision. But uh, that's the end of this graph. Um, but for now, this is kind of a lot of information to take in. So it's easier to just say that basically text needs to be more than 14 pixels tall on the display before your brain can even tell what letters the pixels are making. And at around 20 pixels is comfortable, regardless of the device. So this was gotten using Roboto at the center of the view in, with a text rendering method called signed distance field. 
Different contrast ratios, optics, rendering methods, font weights, and typefaces will be a little different. But saying 20 pixels tall is an easy way to give designers a ballpark baseline to start with. In a game engine, you don't really think in pixels, though. You measure in terms of um, meters and millimeters. So this is a developer conference, so I'll feel a little more safe in throwing up this equation and saying that you can figure out the text height in the game engine as a relationship between the distance to the virtual text, the number of pixels tall you want it, and the pixels per degree of the device. So if you want text 20 pixels high on a device with 13 pixels per degree, you can take the distance to the text and multiply it by 0 0.027 to get its starting height. That's about 1.5 degrees tall from that graph earlier. And for those of you who don't want to bother with an equation, it's fine to just ignore that and take the distance and multiply it by 0 0.027 to get its height. And then just look at it in the headset and see what you think. So now you have a base text size in a basic canvas of field of view and range of motion. These numbers are pretty conservative and rounded because the purpose is to give designers a baseline for VR. It's like when you open a new document and you have the default paper dimensions and font size. With those things put together, you can start imagining the types of interfaces you could make in VR. You can change the canvas, and you can change the text size. But hopefully, it's helpful to at least have that starting point to begin working with. And it makes sense because it's based on the constraints of the system, which are properties of the device and properties of the humans using them. So I've given you some suggestions for the user interface, but there's also the environment that it lives in. Brian will explain his thoughts on designing beautiful environments for VR. Thanks, Mike. Every VR application needs at least one environment. And that might seem obvious for VR games, but it's not as obvious for other non-game types of applications. Today, I want to tell you why these environments are still very important, and really give you some advice on how to create them. Now, in addition to just being cool, a great environment is actually central to a user's uh, sense of presence. Maintaining presence in your applications really should always be a top priority. If done right, an environment helps your users better understand your application. It engages them more, and it makes your product more memorable and more shareable. Now, there's already been a lot written on presence and the value of it. So if you're not familiar with that concept, I encourage you to look it up. Now, the primary value of VR is the ability to take you places. So I'm advocating for taking your users to amazing places. Create destinations that your users want to visit and want to show to others. You've got to make it remarkable. Now, your environment is often the first thing your user sees. It takes up the majority of their field of view at all times. And it's a key part of how they're going to think of your app, how they're going to remember it and describe it. It's also a physical embodiment of your company's brand. So you have to consider how it represents you. Don't think of the environment simply as a wallpaper or a background. Think of it as the destination that your users are going to. Now, I see a lot of applications creating these void-style environments. Now, I understand why. They're fast, they're easy to make, they have great performance, and if you don't have an obvious idea, they might seem like a good fallback. In my opinion, I think that you should not make a void your main environment. I think it's a missed opportunity to create something memorable and shareable. I wouldn't want all my memories of being in your application to be in this strange void space. Now, if you are out of ideas and maybe low on 3D skills or concerned about performance, maybe think about creating an abstract environment. It's a step up from a void, and it can still be branded and memorable. Now, there's no place I have ever been that is completely soundless. And in fact, much of the experience of any environment is its sounds. Your sound design should start right along your visual design, right at the beginning. And one can even influence the other. You could decide to put something into the audio that you decide not to visualize. Maybe you can only hear 
the birds but not actually see them, or, or vice versa. It's also the easiest way to annoy your users, if done wrong. So be careful with repetitive sounds or things that sound fake or volume levels. And in fact, getting sound right in VR is really quite challenging and not obvious at all. There's been a lot said about sound in VR recently, uh, particularly this year at GDC. So I, I encourage you to look that up if you haven't seen it yet. That's surprisingly easy to make people feel uncomfortable in VR environments. Little things, like a room that is a little messy or has things out of place, can make users feel powerless and, and really annoyed by your environment. More obviously, you should try not to scare people. Elements like dark hallways with this mist coming out of it, or partly open doors um, that you don't know what's behind them, or you know, heights, things like that, they can all make users uncomfortable and not want to spend time in your app. But it can be worse than that. You need to really be aware of phobias. This underwater environment might seem really cool, but there are some users so terrified of water that the second they come to this app, they'll, they'll rip the headset off and never come back. Right? And so this, this is something you really need to watch out for. Now, your environment should be designed with your UI, with your content in mind. It should frame it, not fight against it. Now, a detailed environment is really great, but don't let it hurt the usability of your application. Avoid noisy edges or busy content uh, getting in the way of the readability or making it clear to see the content. Now, think about how your UI might even scroll or animate and make sure it doesn't conflict with the environment, you know, clip through things or become obscured. In this mock-up, I use this rock to actually frame the navigation. It protects the text. It creates some visual hierarchy. It also, I allow the light and the clearing to frame the background content and make it the focus. And it's got that, that kind of difference in lighting to say, this is where the content is, this is the navigation. So you can design your environments to really showcase your content. And I don't like to think of the UI and environment as two separate elements, you know, conceptually. Make them feel connected. Make them feel like they live in one world, like it's plausibly existing together. Use things like colors and lighting, shadows, even reflections, animations, physics. All of these things allow you to connect your UI to your environment more. And you can even allow the environment to occlude, sometimes hide parts of the environment or the content while you're scrolling, perhaps. Now, a living environment is much more interesting and much more believable than a static one. There's a lot of things that you can bring to life. Think of wind, water, animals, plants, the dust in the air, the light coming through the trees, clouds, people, machines. The opportunities are endless for animation. And it's about more than just animation. It's about you giving users the ability to interact and to affect the world. They need to feel like they exist in that world. Maybe if they have a little laser pointer that they use to touch the UI, maybe they can use that to create ripples in a pond or to move the leaves or scare away a squirrel. Something like that would actually be really delightful, and it makes the user feel present in that virtual world. Now, creating detailed animations can be really hard and really time consuming if you don't have those skills. An easy way to get that experience is to use particle effects, things like dust motes, falling leaves, fireflies. These things are cheap and easy to create. Uh, one of these effect effects might take two or three minutes to create, even for an unexperienced person, and it does a lot to bring the scene to life. It also gives you a strong sense of stereo 3D as these things move in and out of your near field. Where practical, I use particle effects in every environment. Now, details in the foreground are the ones that really stand out because of that sense of 3D, stereo 3D. As such, I usually try to ensure that I have a good amount of details up close and that I build them at a real geometry so they have some substance, that they feel, they feel solid and real. And of course, uh, beyond 20 meters, you really lose that, eff that effect. And so I encourage you to down-res everything, get rid of the polygons to really save on performance. You should also be careful about creating environments that are going to alias poorly. In fact, this jungle here has all those very fine leaves. This is going to alias like crazy. In fact, when you look at this in a VR headset, it's just going to sparkle. The whole thing will be sparkling at all times, and it's going to be extremely distracting, maybe even uncomfortable. The most important thing you can do for your environment is ensure that it performs well. 
A fluctuating frame rate will make people sick. And a detailed environment is almost always challenging to optimize. Now, if I'm going to give you one piece of advice on designing your environment, remember that your mobile phone is fill bound. Try not to do too much overdraw or transparency. That is the thing that's going to kill you first. But you know, keep your draw calls low, keep your poly count low, and try not to max out the performance of the phone at all times. If you're an app where you want people to watch video for two hours, but your environment is so detailed that it's running the phone at maximum performance, uh, that's going to be challenging. <clears throat> now, an interesting fallback is a concept called ODS, omnidirectional stereo images. Now, it's basically a panoramic image in stereo 3D that can simulate a full environment. Now, they don't have any real-time geometry, and they can have really great performance and be easy to create, but they have some problems. For one, when you put your UI into that, it kind of feels dropped on top. It just does become that wallpaper. It's really hard to create that connection. In fact, it's really hard to use any of the advice I just gave. You can't animate them. You can't really frame things well. So they're not perfect. And you also have to keep in mind that if you have an application where users are going to be turning their head to the side a lot, maybe to investigate something or for long sessions, that the stereo effect actually breaks down when you tilt your head. So it's, it might not be right for everyone. Now, I look forward to visiting the amazing worlds you create. It's actually the part of VR I'm most excited about. Um, up next, I want to let Alex talk about uh, input for Daydream. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. All right, the Daydream controller. It's, uh, the Daydream controller is actually included with every headset, which we're really excited about. And also, um, users have to use the Daydream controller as they're interacting with the home screen. So as a developer, you know that when they launch your application, they're going to have this specific controller in their hand. So you can design directly for it. So let's take a look at it. It has an internal IMU, so you can use it for gesturing and pointing. And then in terms of direct input, you have a two-dimensional touchpad, uh, which is also clickable. Uh, it has sort of a physical click in, like a mouse, a mouse button would click in. And then uh, application developers get an app button. You can use this for really whatever you want, um, pause screen, um, saving your game, an action inside a game or inside the application that you're doing. It's ent really entirely up to you how you want to use the app button. And then there's a home button. And this is reserved by the system for system actions like going back to the launcher, things like that. And additionally, there's some volume buttons on the side that are reserved by the system. So obviously, the first thing you can do with this is point and click. Um, you know, users will initially experience this as they're interacting with the home screen. So as you move the controller around, you will see it um, actually activate things that they're hovering on. And it sort of behaves like a laser pointer. And this is great. Uh, it's, it's very uh, usable. Uh, people you know, can be seated and relaxed. And just by moving the wrist around, they can select things. But there's really a lot more you can do with the controller as well. And we wanted to be able to communicate this out to developers, just how broad the range of things this controller supports is and how big that gesture vocabulary is. So to do that, we created the Daydream Design Playground. This is going to be open sourced um, probably in about a week. Uh, if you're watching this online, it's likely already open sourced. And it has uh, 16 controller demos, um, plus or minus a few. We're still, we're still working on it. So. Um, I want to go through what those demos are and what you can do with this controller. Sort of the goal of, of the Daydream Design Playground is to inspire developers to create entire applications around these types of activities. Maybe not literally the same thing, but around these types of gestures that are possible with the controller. So the first thing you can do is you know, swinging an object. That object could be a tennis racket. Or that object could be, say, maybe a really big hammer in front of a massive xylophone. Or that object could be a sword.
But that's, of course, you know, pretty exciting for the user, but if they want something that's more relaxing, it could be a fishing rod. The next gesture is flicking your wrist. Instead of a full swing, just a, a quick motion of your wrist. One of the seems to be most popular demos we've shown so far is, of course, pancakes. Um, but that remains you know, an open question is, can the user actually do six pancakes, both flipped and correctly delivered onto the plate? Let's see. Come on. Yes? But they have to get them on the plate. Oh, no, they dropped one. Oh, oh well, let's try again. Ah. All right. Uh, it can be a boomerang. Inspecting an object is very interesting with the controller. In the next example, we see the controller actually become the object. So it starts out with a quick gesture. But at this point, the object and the controller are the same thing. So as you move the controller, you can turn the object in your hand and see every side of it. We found this also works for uh, gameplay. Uh, in this case, the marble maze and the controller are the same object. And as you tilt the controller, of course, the marble maze is tilting, and you're controlling the marble. And this, what's exciting about this demo um, is you sort of even forget you're holding a controller as you're doing it. You're just completely focused on the maze. And the maze and the controller really become the same thing. And you're just thinking about the goal. You can also use the controller to move an object for environments that you're creating, um, if you're doing user-generated content. Example of that here, we're doing laser point to select. And then once the object is uh, picked up with a click, you can use the touchpad to actually rotate that object. You can use the touchpad to, to rotate, to bring it towards you. In this case, um, the user is rotating it. They're trying to assemble sort of a 3D puzzle. So they bring it over here. Rotate it into the correct position as they're trying to figure it out. This one was actually a little bit too hard to start with. We had to, we had to make an easier puzzle for people, because 3D puzzles are hard. Um, let me pick up another one. We tried another example. Um, uh, to have a better sense of sort of scale and power, here are the users actually inside a very large crane. Uh, and they're using the controller to bring the arm out. Um, tilt on the controller is the, the joystick in the crane. Uh, the touchpad, in this case, is being used to operate how, how close or far away the statue is from you. So they bring it over, and then they push the controller down to, to drop the object. So that was moving objects. We can also see a lot of uh, interesting use in creating objects. So you could use the controller to carve things. Now, all of those examples were first person, but third person is also a really interesting case for VR. Real-time strategy games, god games, um, you know, things, uh, simulations uh, as you, you know, look down upon uh, a game board. So we wanted to look into third person character control. And just as interesting as first person is for VR, third person can be really interesting as well. So we tried sort of a simple adventure game. 
where you go about and pick up coins. In this case, the, the touchpad on the controller is being used as kind of a traditional joystick or D-pad to move the character. This is one of my favorites. We also tried a real-time strategy game, uh, or at least the mechanics around real-time strategy game. So you can click on a character and then point and click to move that character around, just like you would in a normal real-time strategy game. A gesture on the controller is used for an action there to make the dragon sing. And then here, um, the, the touchpad is actually being used to create a drag rectangle to select multiple characters and then move them around. And they go back to selecting one at a time as they try to solve the puzzle. Another thing the controller is great at is flying, where the controller maps to the object that you're, you're having fly around. This is also a good example of keeping the user grounded. So if the camera was flying forward, that can be, you know, be some, somewhat disorienting. But because they're controlling the kite, and the user still stands on the ground, and we have these big pillars next to them, um, they don't have as much of an effect. And they can still have all the fun of flying while feeling like they're, they're grounded themselves. So trying a, a little kite was interesting. Um, and this is also you know, the, the kite itself is, is on a plane. Um, but we wanted to explore. Uh, flying more in 3D space, um, still with the same, same notion of control. And this next one is actually inspired by like, how kids play with toys. Um, you know, as you've, you sort of gesture with the toy and the toy flies around. Where here, as you move the controller, you're controlling this massive dragon. And especially in VR, as you look up, you get a really interesting sense of scale here. All right, so in conclusion, when you're thinking about users, thinking about 30 minute plus sessions of using your application. This is, it's not snackable as much as it's a full meal. And what we're finding in terms of these actual play sessions in our market research is it's really the, how engaging and immersive the content is that dictates how long the user's uh, playing the session. Whereas with mobile phones, uh, usually something else distracts them, they, they need to you know, get off the subway, or uh, their friend has come back if you're, they're seated in a cafe. In VR, there's nothing to distract them. They've, it's more like they're, you know, they're in their reading nook, and they're fully engaged and immersed in what you're creating. So if you create long-form, story, narrative-driven content, users are going to love that, and they're going to be really lost in the worlds that you make. <clears throat> or if you have incredibly engaging gameplay, really good sword uh, gameplay mechanics, or a really fun tennis game, Users can equally be just as immersed in that for very long periods of time. In terms of ergonomics, think about all the things that, that Mike uh, presented in terms of constraints. Uh, also do a lot of testing on your own applications to make sure that everything's working. Um, and you really want to base your design around these metrics uh, so that the user is as comfortable as possible. For the environment, think about what emotion you want to evoke in your users, how that emotion sort of ties into your brand. You can take the users anywhere. So there's really an infinite canvas of what you can create in terms of the experience that you want users to have as they engage with your applications. Then finally, with the controller, there's an incredibly broad gesture vocabulary. Uh, this is just some of the things that we've shown. We hope you find them inspiring as you craft apps. And everything's open sourced. So if you build your own dev kit, um, and then when you download this, you can actually try out all those applications. There's a few additional ones that I didn't show as well. But you know, as you explore the capabilities of the controller, we're also really excited to see what the development community comes up with, because uh, there's really a lot packed into this controller as to how you can use it. All right, so with that, thank you. And we'll be happy to take questions after the session.